Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Northern Peatlands, a video journey through a fascinating landscape. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Charlie Reinertsen. Charlie, thank you so much for being here today and for bringing us a topic that is close to your heart. I look forward to exploring this with you. Thank you so much, Sunny, and welcome everyone. I'm calling in from Adirondack Park in Saranac Lake, and that's uh, located in Northern New York State. And today we'll cover a topic that I don't often get to cover with Natural Habitat Adventures, uh, because it's a habitat that's really hard to reach, uh, and that is the Northern Peatlands. So today's presentation, I'd really love to dive into that topic, learn about this, and uh, and share with you my process for uh, documenting these really incredible places that um, kind of every time I experience a peat, uh, peatland, it just, um, I learn something new about it and it always surprises me. So we'll dive right in. Today we'll cover uh, my background in photography. We'll talk about peatlands and what can be done to help conserve them. And then if you're interested, you can stick around for a quick video session to talk about the recipe that I use to film really smooth footage. Uh, so we'll take a look at those parameters, whether you're shooting on your iPhone, on your phone, or uh, on a big DSLR camera. So we'll dive right in. If you've heard my webinars before, you've heard that I really got my start uh, as a researcher in biology. And my first study subject was softshell turtles. And so I got to meet this incredible cast of characters in the Mississippi watershed in Minnesota. And I really got a passion for photography as I was documenting the different uh, research projects that I was a part of or that uh, my classmates were a part of. And this kind of launched a career in science communications and uh, capturing photography around the world. And uh, in the last 10 years, I've been doing a lot of writing and brand design and work for nonprofits and conservation groups, uh, most recently working at the Climate Solutions Exhibit in the Adirondacks. And that's what brought me to this incredible place that we'll get to talk to uh, talk about today. And really, I view my work as kind of that interface between uh, what scientists are doing in the field and the research that they're publishing and trying to make that information available to a broader audience. So I'm trying to be that interface uh, between those peer-reviewed science journal articles and the news that you might consume on a daily uh, cadence. And so my photography work really centers around wildlife and landscapes, as well as adventure photography and travel. And uh, it's gotten, you know, provided me the opportunity to partner with incredible groups, including Natural Habitat Adventures. So when I'm not photographing or, or spending time filming in the field, I'm working with Natural Habitat Adventures on one of their uh, trips. Uh, the trips that I lead are the Monarch Migration, which is truly spectacular, uh, the Yellowstone and Grand Teton Wildlife Safari, um, and I also have guided the canyons trip through Grand Canyon, Zion, and Bryce. And those are, you know, all of them are spectacular trips. And at the end, if you want to ask questions about those trips in particular, I'd love to uh, be able to share what I know there. Uh, but today I wanted to take the opportunity to dive into an ecosystem that we don't get to spend a lot of time with as NADHAB guides, and that's Northern Peatlands. So to give you a little information of background on peatlands, these areas are very limited. So when you look at peatland distribution across the world, the red areas are where we find peat. And you'll notice that you do find them at all latitudes uh, around the earth, but they are concentrated, especially in the Northern hemisphere. Peat covers 3% of earth but it stores about 50% of Earth's soil carbon. So this is a huge ecosystem that's really making big headlines and that we're focusing a lot on because it can be a, either a huge part of the solution or a contributing factor uh, towards uh, global warming. Now, just to give you a little sense of how much carbon is stored in peatlands, that's twice as much as all of the carbon that's stored in our global forests 
which when you think about it is pretty amazing. So that puts peatland protection and restoration as a leading climate solution today. And that kind of you know, puts this on the map. And so let's dive into what makes peatlands so powerful. You know, how are they formed? What are they? Uh, there was a graduate student at the North Carolina State University, uh, Madeline Baldwin, and she put together some amazing graphics and research um, uh, talking about the progression of, of taking a peatland that's been destroyed and trying to work towards a restoration effort. Um, and so a lot of these graphics have been uh, you know, brought from that research. So on the left-hand side of this graphic, you're seeing the progression of how a peatland is formed. Uh, peatlands are essentially areas where vegetation, uh, when it dies, it's waterlogged and that area that's um, anaerobic, there's no oxygen, things break down really slowly. And so then you start to build what's called peat. And so the key characteristics are that it's waterlogged and a lot of vegetation. And so on this left-hand side, from the top to bottom, you're starting with a body of water that's fairly shallow, and then more and more organic matter starts to build and accumulate until there's uh, this continued presence of water and vegetation that leads to uh, this, this habitat forming. Often these uh, peatlands will form after events of glaciation. So glaciers have been present on the landscape and as they recede, that opens up these kind of shallow depressions that get filled with organic matter over time. And so you'll have these layers in the peat. And uh, one of my favorite memories with a researcher in the field is walking across a peatland about an hour from where I'm sitting right now and when you're walking on a peatland, you just sink down into the earth. It's like a spongy trampoline. And you never know when you're going to step into an area that will completely give out and you'll be waist deep uh, in water. So this whole kind of floating vegetative mass can be as deep as nine meters or you know, as deep as 30 feet. Um, and so that's all of this organic matter so now you're starting to get an idea of how these areas are storing so much carbon. So right here, this in the center of this image is a peat core sample. So a lot of uh, peat researchers will go out and collect a core sample at all of these different levels within the peat and then study the composition of the plants. And these peatlands can be around for thousands of years. So we're getting information about what plants were present on the landscape um, by looking at peat cores. Peatlands are incredibly unique ecosystems and they support a huge array of biodiversity. What's listed here again is from Madeline Baldwin's research, uh, but it's showing the threatened and endangered peatland species. So this is a habitat that these species rely on entirely. And because this habitat is being threatened, uh, these animals are being threatened as well. And so by preserving or restoring peatlands, will be able to ensure that these animals uh, have habitat that they rely on. So let's dive into the specific area of peatlands that we'll talk about today. So we're looking at northern peatlands in North America. So you're seeing here that Alaska has a good representation and then there's this huge swath from the northwestern part of Canada down uh, to the south eastern part of Canada. And then there are some speckling throughout uh, Michigan, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, Lower Michigan, and then there's some speckling throughout the eastern coast. And what we'll talk about today is some of the speckling that's happening in Adirondack Park. And so here's this red circle is roughly where Adirondack Park is located in New York State. And Spring Pond Bog is the location that we'll be going to in particular. And that is located kind of in the heart of the high peaks region of the Adirondacks. And just taking a look at where it is geographically. Uh, so it's, it's again, kind of in that high peaks region, south of Montreal. Um, and we will be going to this particular location. So uh, I reached out to the Nature Conservancy who owns this property and helped conserve this incredible landscape. This is the second largest bog in New York state. So it is massive. And uh, I was given permission to be able to film uh, by drone uh, and take photographs of this area. 
uh, to be able to help promote the conservation of, of this bog. And uh, so without any further ado, I would love to just jump into sharing a video that kind of pieces together exploring this habitat. So on this image in particular, you can see all the areas that kind of have a tinge of red. That is the peatland. And there are these three dots within it um, in the center of this image. And those are lakes that feature pretty prominently within the video that I'm about to share. Uh, so I uh, essentially, this was a uh, to be able to visit this land, anyone can visit it. Uh, you just reach out to the Nature Conservancy and book a private pass, and there's this gate that they'll open during certain hours of the day, and then it's about an hour's uh, drive on some cobblestone, you know, really, really rough road going out. Um, and then you finally do a, a hike to be able to get out on this landmass, this peninsula that is, extends into the center of the peatland. And that's where I was able to launch my drone and a big part of why drone photography is so special and important in this area is that uh, it's it's not great to walk on peat. You know, if if too many people are allowed to walk across this landscape, it is a fragile ecosystem uh, that can be damaged. When I was walking on the peatland with the researcher in the story that I shared at the beginning of this presentation, uh, that was for research purposes. So very few people are allowed to go out onto this area. Um, and that's to protect it. And so these aerial images are really a way to have this experience that you wouldn't be able to have otherwise uh, and explore this landscape that you would never be able to explore uh, in this in this exact way. So uh, it'll just take me a moment to share the right video. And I did drop a link into the chat. If you would like to watch this on your own screen, there's no audio attached to this video. This is actually a demo reel that I'm putting together. I'll later publish a full documentary uh, in 2024. Uh, but this is just a, a short reel, uh, three minute long piece. And if you watch it on your own, the quality will be much higher. But for now, I'll just play this and we'll head into the peatland. So this is one of three areas where there's open water within the bog itself. And to give you scale of what you're looking at, you'll have a couple images here. Look at these trees. Though Each of those trees are about 10 to 15 feet in height, maybe 20 at the most. A lot of black spruce are, are growing out on the peatland itself. And so that gives you a sense of scale of how vast of a landscape we're looking at. Again, this is the second largest bog uh, in New York State. And in New York State, that's the southernmost area that northern peatlands can be found. So another way of saying it is that this particular ecosystem doesn't exist any further south. And so it's incredibly important that researchers are studying what's happening here uh, because as we know, we're going to have poleward migration of species. And that means that um, with changing climate, with warming summers, longer, uh, shorter winters, uh, animals will need to be moving to cooler areas. So generally that means migrating upwards in elevation or north if you're in the northern hemisphere. So this particular ecosystem is going to, because it's at the southernmost extent of its range, it's going to experience the effects of climate change first. And so if we're researching this, it can be a bit of a canary in the coal mine. Uh, and so there are a number of, of universities and, and individual researchers who are spending their entire career looking at this very ecosystem and understanding, doing bird surveys, you know, what birds are present in this location, what uh, plant species are present, and how are those uh, species distributions changing as the years go on. So, so far in this film, you've seen three different bodies of water. This is the third one here. Uh, I think it's kind of a fun, fun shape. It kind of looks uh, almost like a Pac-Man or something. Uh, but this is truly just a jaw-dropping ecosystem. You know, this, my color reproduction that I do for these videos and for my photography, I'm trying as hard as I can to match the exact colors that I saw on the day. And so, you know, these electric greens and these deep reds, this was filmed in early June. 
And these are the colors that you would see if you were get if you were able to visit and maybe fly in a small plane to be able to see these these areas here. And uh, so you're seeing all these different like micro vegetation communities where uh, you'll see a patch of golden sedges and then another patch of red. All of that red and some of the green is actually sphagnum. So these northern peatlands are primarily composed of sphagnum moss, type of moss, and that type of moss is just really dense in carbon. And so as that those plants die, they sink down, and um, that is a slow process of decomposition. So that was the end of that film. I'm just going to switch over here back to the presentation. All right, just give it a moment to refresh. All right, looks like it's frozen a little bit, so I'm just going to pause sharing. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> Sunny, are you there? I've got a little bit of a freeze. I am here. But so I'm not it, sure what I can do on my end. <laughs> I'm just wondering, is, is the slide that's up right now, the first slide, the uh, behind the camera? Yeah. Which, yeah. Nope. It says aerial filming location. Oh, perfect. So Great. that's the yeah. that's the right slide. It's just on my screen. It's frozen. All right. We'll keep going here. So again, this is that uh, Google Maps image, of a satellite image showing where we were just filming. And those three dark dots were those three different lakes uh, that we got a close-up view of by drone. So this is that first lake. And uh, one of the things I'll point out is that you have all these hummocks, these areas that are lower and then areas that are higher. And in those depressions or slightly elevated areas, you're actually getting different types of plants. And something that I left out is that because you have really low oxygen levels and so much plant material that's decomposing really slowly, uh, you actually have really acidic environments. And so these plants are just perfectly adapted to this particular ecosystem. Here, we're getting a little bit of a lower down perspective close to the water. Um, the, the water is very tannin stained and that's, that's what gives it kind of these really rich colors. Uh, tannins are are just chemicals that are in plants or leaf material. This is the trail that I walk out on, and you're seeing that trail, that brown line in the center of the image, uh, go along that peninsula that I pointed out in the map. And then on the right-hand side of the image, you're seeing uh, the actual peatland. So that transition from forest to peatland, and that is just elevation of land. So as soon as the land mass comes up high enough, to get out of the water because as soon as you step onto the peatland your foot sinks into water and depending on where you step that could be a really dangerous uh, dangerous step so here's that other body of water on the left hand side moving from top left to top right you're starting to see some dark lines and those are animal tracks trails and so it's one of my goals to be out there and be able to film a moose moving across this landscape because even though this is a floating mass of vegetation, it can support weight as heavy as a moose and they're very intuitive with knowing where to be able to move across the landscape. So one thing as a photographer editing these images, again, I'm trying to reproduce the colors of the landscape, but as you get higher and higher in elevation, the atmosphere starts to interact with the way that you're producing the image and so the colors start to get a little bit different and the re reflectivity of these different areas also comes into play so it becomes a little bit of a challenge when you're back in the studio to be able to dial in these colors and i'm still these images are not ready for release yet i'm still kind of dialing this in uh, to the point where i feel like i'm accurately reproducing what i was able to see and there are laws about uh, how high you can fly a drone. So all these images are taken below 400 feet above ground level, which is the FAA uh, rules and regulations. Here we have just this, this pool itself is probably uh, about 15 feet wide. And that's just a, a small area of water with some lily pads in it. And uh, 
And this is what it looks like from 400 feet above ground level, uh, where you just start to have these wild colors of all the different vegetation types and uh, different areas where you have small depressions or elevations or different species present. Here, this is taken about 10 feet above the ground. Uh, for reference, that green patch in the kind of middle to the upper left of the frame is a, a tree that's about 10 feet tall. And so all of this is just kind of shrubbery. I was trying to give that feeling that you're kind of walking across the landscape in that image. And here, again, much higher up, uh, starting to get those kind of wave patterns that start to happen in peatlands. And there are so many people studying this from hydrologists to physicists to ecologists to understand why are the plants growing in these patterns and is it based on the wind kind of moving around these land masses or the particular microclimate in that specific place uh, it really is just a uh, kind of a preposterous uh, landscape so kind of coming back to that initial concept that i shared in the beginning peatland protection and restoration is a leading climate solution so we've heard a lot in the news about permafrost and what's happening when all of these areas are starting to thaw and releasing carbon and that's true peatlands are a source of of um, emissions greenhouse gas emissions when they start to dry up and so there's a lot of work being done to try and uh, restore, re-wet the landscape that has had has supported peatlands in the past, uh, to be able to bring this um, uh, you know uh, landscape back and to be able to thus sequester more carbon. Because if you remember back, it occupies only three percent of the landmass of Earth, and yet it is able to store forty-four percent, nearly half of all of our global carbon uh, stored in soil. Uh, so how can we support peatlands? Uh, one of the groups that I look to for information like this is Project Drawdown, and they've put together a comprehensive plan for how to address climate change. And so you can go to their website and search by solution, and if you search, you know, peatland protection, they'll talk about peatlands uh, and everything you need to know in that area. And they've done a lot of calculations to figure out how big of a solution is peatlands compared to getting cars off the road. And so uh, in this instance, they're showing that about 15% of the world's peatlands have been degraded. And so they're identifying that the solution is to preserve land and prevent, prevent fire. So one thing that's happened is uh, drying out peatlands and converting them to agricultural lands. Um, and that releases tons and tons of carbon. So if we can find a way to both achieve that agricultural need and also restore peatlands, that is a huge success and we're able to start sequestering more carbon than we're releasing. Um, and so those are the big pieces. And then they also have these really helpful, like, what can I do to be able to help? Um, and essentially what they've boiled it down to here, and this is not a end all be all, um, but trying to find ways to donate or um, contribute towards the protection and restoration of these really critical landscapes. As I mentioned, uh, the places that I've been showing in the photographs, with the exception of these last two images, uh, were Spring Pond Bog, which was conserved by the Nature Conservancy. And there are many groups that uh, do that work of both protecting existing bogs and peatlands and then also uh, restoring them. Uh, this fall, I'll be putting together an, an exhibit on this work. Uh, it'll be featured at St. Lawrence University as a part of a larger exhibit with many contributing artists. Um, call, and this exhibition is called Listening to Water. Uh, I'll be doing an, a, an artist talk on uh, this October at 6.30 p.m. And uh, you're welcome to join. And I'm sure there will be a recording to share. And if you're interested in seeing more of my work, uh, you can head to my gallery online. Uh, where you'll find all different types of ecosystems around the world. The uh, the sneak peek that you got today is not published yet. As I mentioned, I'm still working on these images. Uh, and if you'd like to hear more about them, you can tune back in on September 11th, right here, where you get your daily dose of nature with Natural Habitat Adventures. And we'll dive back into this topic and see where we are at that point.
uh, I will be uh, guiding this fall. The next trip that I have is in September uh, within Yellowstone National Park in Grand Teton, which is one of my favorite times of year to guide there. It is uh, just an incredible ecosystem to explore, talk about very unique ecosystems where you have uh, the interaction of a super volcano with all these charismatic megafauna. So really amazing place. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me if you'd like to hear more about my work. Um, and you can find my website at twoline.com where I uh, you know, work uh, with organizations and nonprofits uh, and outdoor industry to be able to help share their message. And uh, also just right at the end here before I hop to questions, I, I did promise that I'd share kind of the uh, smooth sailing filming, filming recipe. And so this is just going to be a quick walkthrough. They will publish this uh, video. Uh, so there might be some folks who are not interested in this. So I'll just go through it quickly and you can always go back and pause and be able to take notes here. Uh, but my quick recommendations, whether you're on your phone, which has most likely some manual settings, or if you're on a camera of any sort, is to set the white balance. Often our cameras want to jump into auto mode and that'll create a color flicker. So your camera is always, as you reframe a shot, it's actually changing the color uh, composition. So you might shift from a really warm image to a really cool image. And that is really frustrating for when you get into editing your footage or even just looking at it. Uh, so if you set it manually, you can set it for 5,500 and forget it because that's the daylight setting, which is what you'll be shooting at most of the time. You can always edit that in post. Uh, this is a huge one. So as cameras have been able to shoot as much as 120 or 220 frames per second, uh, people just think, and I am one of those people up until recently, that the higher number is better. And this is an instance where lower is better. So 24p is actually going to produce really smooth motion because you'll actually blur in between the frames, which helps your eye. Sometimes when you have 220 or 120 frames per second, it starts to create a jerky image. Uh, and even though it's perfectly crisp, if you were to look frame by frame, your eye doesn't interpret it that way because it doesn't know where to land. And so setting it to 24 is a great way to do that. And the rule of thumb with shutter speed is that it's always double your frame rate for video. And so if you did happen for whatever reason, if you're shooting something that is a subject that's really moving quickly and you jumped your frame rate up, just make sure you double your shutter speed to compensate. That file size, uh, shoot as big as you can is, is my go-to. In this instance, it's 4K. Uh, and uh, but always think about your final sharing. If you're only ever going to look at it on your phone, 1080p is a great place to sit. And that's not going to influence the smoothness, smooth, smoothness of your film, but it will influence how nice it looks. Um, finally, the movie file type, this doesn't really matter, just like .mov. And ISO, always shoot as low as possible because that's going to be the most sensitive that you can create your camera sensor and that will reproduce colors the most accurately and just create a better image. A couple tools to help your smooth filming is that when you're doing the balance of shutter speed and uh, to ISO, the last variable is, is looking at aperture. So to be able to set the right aperture, sometimes you need to add on a neutral density filter. So this image is just a graduated neutral density filter so that you can adjust it, but you can also get multiple of them. And basically it's just sun, uh, sunglasses for your camera uh, to be able to make it so that you can drop all the settings and be able to shoot at the right shutter speed, which is what we just shared. Um, so the other thing that helps make a really smooth image is a tripod or a gimbal or a drone uh, and really smooth flying. Um, and then the other really helpful thing is shooting with a color card. So you actually buy these and you put them in the frame of one of your shots. And then in post editing, you select the grayscale uh, to be able to flatten out the color of the image and make it as natural as possible. And then finally, uh, one of the big uh, problems with some of the current software on cameras is that it's constantly searching for eyes and for faces to be able to create the focus point. 
And so if you have a subject that's moving, that's great. You could be tracking those things, but sometimes when you're shooting a landscape, the camera doesn't know where to focus. So the big thing that I recommend is select the area you want to focus on, lock it in, and then switch over to manual focus. So start in auto, use that half press on your shutter uh, or tap on your phone, and then just lock the focus so that it can't move once you get into the actual shot. Sometimes you're going to want to adjust the auto fo or adjust the focus as the shot continues, but um, this is just a, a place that can be a, a pitfall if you rely on the autofocus too much, because sometimes you can get back to your computer on a bigger screen and start to realize that it's really distracting to have the focus switching as you as you film. So those are just my quick, quick tips uh, for smooth filming. Um, feel free to ask me questions, but uh, for now, I'd love to open it up to any questions about peatlands. Uh, I'll do my best to answer. This is an area that I'm still learning about um, and uh, as well as the NAPHAB trips that I guide. So thank you very much for your time. Charlie, thank you for giving us access to a place rarely seen. Um, it's, it's really, truly a fascinating glimpse. Um, there are lots of questions, so let's just go ahead and dive right in. Um, do you know the age of the Adirondack peatland in comparison to peat bogs in Northern Ireland? Oof. Wow, I, I would definitely have to do some research on that to know. Uh, it would really come down to um, most, most likely all the peatlands across the world are starting to be formed after glaciers receded most recently. So just based on a theoretical answer, that's not true. Um, I'd have to do the research to be able to find this out. Theoretically, glaciers melted away uh, in New York State more recently than Ireland because Ireland is further north in latitude. Um, so theoretically, we could have older peatlands here, but the other question is whether they've been degraded or whether they've been peatlands all, you know, all the way back in history to the period, the most recent period of glaciation. And you could have a peatland that uh, existed and then there were glaciers and then it continued to exist so you could have incredibly old old peatlands but uh thank you thank you for that question i'll, I'll have to look that one up mm -hmm. um are some peatlands frozen how do peatlands relate to permafrost yes that is a great question so peatlands can be frozen uh so permafrost is just that uh uh permafrost is what we refer to when something remains frozen the entire year. So it's not melting uh, at any point. Uh, it's, it's persisting in, in the ground. Um, in this instance, in that kind of mixed vegetation and water environment of a peat land. The problem that we're seeing is that permafrost, you're exactly right, it is occurring in peatlands in those Northern areas where you still have ice forming year round that doesn't melt. And as it's melting, there is a process where some of the land will fall. It'll it'll kind of collapse into itself as because ice is more dense and larger uh, uh, than than liquid water. It takes up more space, so it's less dense. But uh, and um, as that landmass falls away, and uh, the the it, it is releasing greenhouse gases, methane and, and carbon dioxide. Um, as that um, decomposition rates increase from what they used to be. Because if, if permafrost is essentially trapped, like you can't, that carbon can't escape. Uh, so we are having those issues and that is a big concern. And part of, if you dig into Drawdown's climate solution of peatlands, part of what they're advocating is that if we can restore peatlands to what they once were, remember it's 15% of all global peatlands have been degraded. If we can restore that whole 15%, it's gonna offset what's gonna happen, which is we're gonna lose our permafrost. There's gonna be a huge release of greenhouse gases, but if we restore the rest of the peatlands, which don't always rely on permafrost, then we can essentially equal it out and make it a climate solution, if that, if that makes sense. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. That's really yeah, good. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. Are there pockets of peatlands further south from New York? Absolutely. Um, it would take me a long time to shuffle back, but I'm going to try. Uh, so if we go back to that global map of peatlands, 
you can find peatlands everywhere on earth like anywhere on earth oh, of course it's going to freeze right there um it's just that they're heavily concentrated uh they're very very heavily concentrated in the northern hemisphere in particular it's just going to take me a little bit to shuffle down to that slide but i'll take another question while it while it's thinking about what it wants to do here sounds good um i just want to mention that the the link that you um shared is in the chat i went ahead and passed it on to oh, the the entire audience so if people are interested in that please do look in the chat you can copy and paste it Awesome. Um, are there carnivorous plants growing in the peatlands and what are the most uh, threatened plants that are living there currently? That's a really good question. So the, the, the first part of the question, are there carnivorous plants? There are so many really weird plants that live in the bog and one of them is the pitcher plant, which is carnivorous and, and it's kind of this, this, it looks like a pitcher and it's green and red and beautiful colors and at the very bottom is like a, um, a digestive fluid that if and it smells very good to bugs and so they'll crawl into the pitcher plant and then get into that juice and and die and then the plant will be able to to break down that uh, creature and and consume it for energy which is wild they also are able to pho photosynthesize so they're able to get their energy multiple ways. The other one that you find a lot is sundews, which is uh, like a mini Venus flytrap that does the same thing. They'll actually catch, capture their prey. Um, and so tons of really weird plants, but to the second question of, of what's endangered, um, orchids. This is a huge environment for orchids. Uh, and so if you, um, Orchids are a highly specialized plant. Usually it's one particular species pollinates one particular species of orchid. And the entire structure of the flower is developed to be a specialist to the pollinating insect. And so because of because there is such a niche organism, uh, they it is a big challenge for them. And so those are highly threatened. But a lot of these are threatened. I'm just going to pop through these slides. Here's the threatened and endangered peatland species. And this doesn't include plants. And it might not be up to date. This was published about 10 years ago. Um, but it does give you a sense of like a lot of, of creatures, including moths, that pollinate a lot of flowers or plants that are that are exclusively living in peatlands. Yeah, thanks for the mm -hmm. question. Sure. Do you know if Russia is making any efforts to preserve their very extensive peatlands? I don't know the answer to that question. And I, I do think that globally this has become on the it has come on the radar in a very different way recently because of concerns for climate change, because of concerns for permafrost, permafrost, um, permafrost. And uh, so I don't know the specific uh, kind of conservation efforts into each country. I just know that um, this is being talked about more often and it's being heightened because with climate change, this is a really vulnerable ecosystem. Hmm. Okay. Um, this is a fun one and I've often wondered it myself. What is the meaning behind two lined in your... <laughs> Business address. <laughs> That's a great question. So, uh, Two Line Studio is referencing the Two Line Salamander. So, uh, my my favorite creatures are kind of the unsung heroes. Uh, two Line Salamanders are really quirky animals. Uh, they they can regrow their tails. They uh, have an aquatic and a terrestrial life stage. They travel really far distances for how small they are. Uh, so, so I really love salamanders and toads and frogs, and uh, I was I was kind of taken with the name and thought it would be a, a fun uh, kind of uh, you know hidden uh, Easter egg for people that ask or that find out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, which lens do you use on your Nikon Z6? <laughs> Somebody was really paying close attention to those pictures. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, so I have a number of different lenses. I love the S line uh, lenses that, that the Z mount S line. Uh, but what I found is that the prime lenses are, are are just incredible, regardless of what line they're coming from. 
Uh, so I have a 105 millimeter macro lens that I've really enjoyed using and a 400 millimeter prime. Uh, and those two lenses have been my go-to for a lot of work lately. Uh, but for a long time, uh, the first camera, and, and honestly, like a lot of the work that I have published, um, it, it was shot with uh, a Nikon D810, uh, and it was just with a 24 millimeter and a 50 millimeter. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a big advocate that that you can you can do anything with with very little. <laughs> Well, on a similar topic, um, can you tell us what drone you use? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I use a DJI Mavic 3 Pro. Uh, and so I used to use an Inspire 2, which is a really huge, heavy piece of equipment that has a, a detachable camera and detachable lenses that you can attach. Uh, but recently, the drone technology and camera technology is just getting better and better. I mean, the technology that's in your phone these days, uh, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous that photographers will be obsolete. Uh, but uh, the DJI Mavic 3 Pro that I have uh, has three lenses built in, and it's a very compact uh, thing that uh, just within the last couple of years that they've released it has replaced some of the really big, out-of-date, hefty technology that we used to use as professional aerial photographers. Uh, so it's exciting. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a rapidly changing field. And do you use filters on the drone as well? Yeah. So when I was talking about neutral density filters, uh, those I I rarely use them when I'm doing photography, uh, but it's always on for videography. It just uh, it's very easy to get a washed out sky um, in in video, and it's really hard to be able to have the settings so that you can get that one over sixties shutter speed. And so by adding on neutral density, I'm I'm usually shooting with an ND twelve or an ND thirty two, sometimes sixty four if it's a really bright day. And peatlands are tough because they're really reflective materials, uh, whether it's the water or the, or the peatland itself. And so um, Often I'm relying on those filters to be able to knock that down and make it a more uh, level level image. Hmm. Um, is there a difference between a peatland and a bog, or are those <laughs> pretty much referring to the same thing? Yeah. So I'm still reading about this. Uh, there are so many different words: bog, mire, fen, uh, peat, um, and and they're all referring in some way to water. So how water moves through that ecosystem, if you think back to that aerial image uh, from Google Maps um, of Spring Pond Bog, there is a river that comes into that area. So depending on, I don't, I don't have the classifications memorized yet. I'd have to look at a chart. Um, but one of them, Bog or, uh, or uh, Peatland, um, is just deposition of water, so no spring or river coming into it. Another one of them is is uh, river entrance. Another one is river entrance and exit. So, depending on how water exists within it, is fed into it and exits, it's called a different name. Um, in, and in this instance, it's uh, peatland, but it's spring pond bog because it's a type of peatland that is a bog based on the hydrology of the area. So it's a complicated thing. And if you look into it, there are just it, there's an exhaustive, huge list of things that you can call peatlands. Uh, and it's it's kind of fun to get into. Well, that's a great segue into our next question, because it sort of overlaps with what you alluded to, but I'm not sure if it was actually answered. It says, it appears the peatland is supported by shallow groundwater. Are there studies being done at Spring Pond Bog to monitor or study the groundwater system? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I'd have to. I know there. I, I know a few of the researchers who work out there. Um, I'm not sure exactly what studies are happening currently, uh, but it is a it's a huge concern of of a lot of different agencies to look at water quality and just kind of looking at the history of Adirondack Park just to go back in time a little bit. Uh, before it was established as Adirondack Park, uh, it was heavily logged to the point where uh, New York City gets all of its water from this area, this drainage. Uh, and in the 1900s, early 1900s, the water quality got so poor that 
New York state legislators decided that they were going to protect this area because it was essentially stripped of all trees. And so we've had this huge reforestation and restoration movement in this area. Um, and now there are all kinds of laws protecting both the watersheds and the, and the forests and land. And it's forever wild. Like most of the area within Adirondack Park is forever wild. And all of it has special protections put in place, whether it's private or public land. Uh, really fascinating landscape and a long answer to your question, but the um, it's within the heart of Adirondack Park. And arguably that that is an area that's, you know, maybe has the strongest protections within the United States and has had them for the longest period of time. All that to say that the water still has uh, challenges um, and and there are still issues of pollution that that are working on, uh, you know, in the St. St. Lawrence watershed that does impact this area. So uh, long winded and maybe not a complete answer to your question, but that's that's the ramble response, I guess. <laughs> well, it, it is a complicated question and there's a suggestion that maybe you could offer a webinar about the differences between fens and marshes and swamps and bogs and uh, and so forth. So you might want to submit right. that for a future I'll, webinar. I'll, I'll earmark it. <laughs> Our viewers loved your presentation, as did I. Thanks again for Thank sharing this unique space with us. Um, that's the last question we have today. So I'll hand it back to you for closing comments. Great. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, and if you'd love to, you know, hear more, uh, you can tune in again. Uh, I don't have the slide up, uh, but it's coming up soon. Just uh, look back at NatHab's website. I think it's September 11th. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, and thanks to everybody who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next daily dose of nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.